It doesn't matter how many times I get up here. I always get nervous. Every time. But it's all good. So um, I know Pastor said he was done talking about the assembly, but I'm going to go right back to it. Because, um, man, if you went, you definitely came back changed. I know I did. All the speakers, they were awesome. You know, the worship was amazing as always. Um, you know, seeing my brothers, Tim and Mike, on the stage, my sister Karen, awesome, awesome. Um, yeah, so pretty much the last time I went to an assembly was 2010. I think I missed a few. <laughs> but it's all good. Um, you know, it's 2024 and a lot's changed. And uh, the scripture that came to mind the entire time I was there was uh, James chapter 1. Let's see if I can find it. 2 through 8. So I'm going to go ahead and read that. So, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver for a person with divided loyalties and unsettled as a wave in the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord, for loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they were unstable in everything they do. Um, kind of basing off that, you know, my loyalty was kind of divided when I left. Half in, half out, you know, I would run into John and Karen, Joe and Heather, Carrie, and it's like, I'd see them up like, <laughs> run this way, you know, like, because I know what they were going to ask me. When are you coming back to church? I lied. I was like, oh, soon. Soon. I'll be back soon. And it just, I never came. So, but needless to say, here I am. I'm back. So I finally came back. Um, so, yeah, just uh, kind of sticking with the assembly. Um, yeah, so it was pretty cool. So 15 years ago or 14, whatever, give or take, when I left, um, I left with some burdens. But um, this year at the assembly, sorry. Ooh, I was able to write some of those wrongs from the past. Praise the Lord. Sorry, sorry. Amen. That's all right. We don't see enough of that. That's good. That's good. Praise God. Bless you, Lord. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Take your time. Yeah. I only got 10 minutes, Tim. So yeah, but like I said, I was able to right some wrongs, and um, these two um, that I haven't seen in a very long time um, kind of ended on bad terms, I guess you could say, and it was a lot of just bumping heads all the time, and um, you know, to make it funny, like me and Keo talked, and some of you guys are probably aware who I'm talking about, but it was just kind of like, we know what's going to happen, I'm just going to be good, I'm going to be nice, and um, and I ran into these two, and um, you know, I'm sitting in the discipleship uh, workshop with Keo. We're having a great time, and uh, the speaker goes, "Oh, you know, I'm standing and stretch." And I get up and stretch, and I look over, and I'm like, "You got to be kidding me!" <laughs> <laughs> Not even an hour into this place, and I've already run into him. <laughs> cool. All right, God, I see what you're doing. And um, so we continued on. You know, it just um, it got dreadfully hot in that room, and y'all know me, I don't like the sweat. So me and Keo, we uh, it was the end of this. Into the lesson, though, I promise. So we left, and uh, we were walking through the gift shop. We ran into Ben, which is a um, young adult over um, in the Okoy Spanish Church, a church of a prophecy that we just went to a revival for. We were talking to him, and then, um, you know, we're talking, having a great time, and then I see the two walking up. So I'm like, all right, here it is, moment of truth, right? So we're talking, and, you know, they're, um, I'll just say it, it was uh, Lynn and Kevin Nugent. Um, and they walked up, and Lynn was just kind of like, hey, are we cool and everything? I'm like, absolutely. I'm like, absolutely. Like, you know, I just, it's, it was a long time ago. Here we are now. It's all good. 
And I noticed, uh, you know, Kevin was just kind of wandering. I'm like, okay, like I can still sense a little, but it, it's all good. Um, so later that night, uh, me and Keo, we go to sit down for lunch or dinner at that time. And then we were graced by lovely Judy. She came and hang, hung out with us and had dinner with us. And then um, they come walking by, saying hi and everything. And I just, at that moment, I'm like, knowing me, I'm like, this is not going to come easy. And, um, but I was like, you know what? I'm just going to take that step and I'm going to walk on some water. Mm -hmm. Like Pastor's been talking about. Yes, yes. So I walked up to Kevin and told him, you know, it's like, you know, having two girls on my own now, I understand where he was coming from with a lot of things. Because we did bump our heads, and you know, I, I told him right then and there, I'm like, I apologize for everything. And it was cool, because you know, it's like, okay, ooh, got that off my chest, now I can enjoy the rest. So we end up, next thing you know, we end up all hanging out the entire night. I was like, really? But it was cool though, we had a great time, you know, it was, it was nice. Um, so then um, the next day, me and Co, Keo were, uh, we were gonna wake up, take the girls with us, and enjoy the day, and then because I had to go teach jujitsu at night. So I'm like, oh, you know, we'll just we'll miss the night service, but we'll go there in the day and have a good time, drop Layla off in the little kids' adventure thing that they did. Well, I overslept. We all did. I mean, if you know my kids, they sleep. My mom and dad can attest to that. If you let them, my daughter Layla will probably sleep until 12 o'clock if you let her. I wonder who she got that from. <laughs> so, but, um, so with needless to say, you know, we got up and, you know, I could tell he was like anxious, you know, I was like, man, like, I should have just got up. Again. Um, so then I finally, I kind of looked at her like throughout the day. And I'm like, you really want to go, don't you? She's like, yes. I'm like, all right, tell you what, let's just get dressed. I'll drop you and the girls off. I'll go teach my class and then I'll come shooting back. Anybody that went to the assembly, that's not an easy task. But, and um, it was funny because like the night before, I was worried because I'm like, I hate traffic. I despise it. Tim was telling me how much of trouble he was having on a Thursday night. Mind you, I'm doing this on a Friday night. I'm like, e. So we get up, I drop him off. It was actually a nice trip over. I guess, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm rushing, I'm sorry. Um, I'm rushing over and I get there and there's no buses running. There's not one in sight. I'm like, hmm. I'm like, well, I can't park at the hotel because they'll tow me. And there's no buses. So I'm like, okay, well, and I think me and Tim, we actually did the same thing. We looked up, how far is the walk? They said an hour and 45 minutes. I'm like, there's no way. <laughs> it's Florida, it's hot, no, not happening. So I just, you know, I just like, you know what, God, if it's your will for me to be there tonight, because something's telling me to go, then I'll, I'll, I'll make it. And literally, as soon as I open my eyes, here comes a bus. I'm like, well, amen. So I text him back, I'm like, hey guys, I'm on my way. And there was no traffic the whole way there. It was like a straight 18 minute drive, which never happens. He just said, I got there and, um, this is when it really, like, you know, me taking a step on water, you know, walking on water led to Kevin as well. After the service, he came up to me. And he's like, hey, can we talk man to man? I'm like, yeah, sure. The last time I heard this was not good. <laughs> so I was like, all right, yeah. So I sat down and um, he apologized for everything that he put me through. And I was like, whoa. And I was like, you know, all I could say was just thank you. And just I'm sorry again as well. So we were able to both walk out of there. Next thing you know, we're walking side by side, going to get coffee, walking side by side to go here, go there. And I'm like, 15 years ago, this would have not been happening. Yes. But through God's grace, yes. it happened. Yes. By stepping out on that water, like Pastor's been preaching, it happened. And um, getting to the other part of my story, and then I'm done. I'm sorry, yes. Um, so many of you guys know I work at the hospital now. Right? I stepped away from teaching at the gym up at Extreme Gracie in Claremont, but now I'm at the Advent Health out in Altamont Springs, and I'm also coaching and teaching in Okoy now for jujitsu. And when I tell you, like, um, if I know you, I'll talk to you all day. But if I don't, I'm sorry, I can't. Right, it was just like one of those, like, I just, hey, how you doing? Right, even meeting these younger guys, like, it's just kind of like, hey guys, how you doing? But once I get to know you, I don't shut up. Right, Jared? <laughs> <laughs> so this job, needless to say, has really opened me up to talking to strangers because it's literally just people I don't know. And this uh, young gentleman, um, he's in his 30s. Um, you know, I came up to him. I noticed, you know, he just got done with a surgery. So he had just things just coming out of him and draining. And I'm like, whoa. 
Like, you know, sometimes you forget you're in a hospital until you see certain stuff like that. And, um, you know, we had a good conversation the first time I saw him. You know, he's like, you know, my, my faith is good, you know, I know God. And I was like, amen, that's awesome. The next time I saw him, apparently like a couple days later, then he now had COVID. And, you know, so I went back and picked him up. I'm like, you know, we got our phone. It shows you all the details of what we're dealing with. I'm like, wow, like, that's crazy. I just saw him like two days ago. So it's scary for me because I just saw him. Dealt with him, you know, transported him. And he kept asking why and how. If I'm in a room, nobody's coming to visit me, and I'm not being, like, seeing anybody. My family's at home. How am I getting this? Why am I getting this? So I just was straight up with him. I'm like, it's, tempta it's a temptation of your faith, man. It's the enemy trying to attack your, your faith. That's all it is. And, you know, and I told him, I was like, you know, you just got to take this test, and you got to turn it into your testimony. Amen. Needless to like, that's it, plain and simple. You need to take this test and turn it into your testimony. So, you know, the, the assembly, going back to that, you know, I was praying for him a lot because I was like, man, this guy really touched my heart a little bit. So I was praying for him, praying for him, praying for him. I come back Monday. I get the call. No COVID. Gone. So now I can actually walk in the room. I don't have to have the visor on, the mask, the gown, the gloves. I can actually just go in as I am and have a conversation with them. And we're talking. I'm like, dude, I just wanted you to know, like, I was praying for you. At our assembly, we had, like, you were deep on my mind. And you went, oh, yeah, how did your four days off go? He's like, you get some rest? I'm like, no. <laughs> no rest at all. No rest at all. But I was like, I did enjoy my four days off. And we're sitting there just chit-chatting, seeing how he's doing. And um, I just, I was led to pray for him right there in the room. And that's what's cool about Advent Health is, like, they encourage prayer. They're just like, talk about prayer. Yes. Whether you're in the hallway, in the room, in the elevator, they encourage it. So I took advantage of that. So I just asked him, like, can I pray for you? He's like, absolutely. So we got him just testing positive and now it's negative. I held his hand. And we prayed right there in the room. Wow. And as I was walking out, he's like, hey, can I get your phone number? I'm like, yeah, like, give me one second. Well, I ended up having another call. I had to go. But I was like, you know, I had some downtime. So I'm like, you know what? I'm like fumbling around. I'm like, man, I really wish I had a business card. I should have grabbed a couple from the church that I can at least give out, right? But um, so I just had a little notebook in my bag. I just pulled it out real quick. I wrote down my information, my phone number. And I gave it to him. And I was like, you hit me up if you ever need anything or if you need a church to come to and just have people love on you. Um, I didn't get to share this with my wife yesterday, but um, I walked by his room to go check on him. And he's not there. So I don't know if maybe they transferred him to another room. I don't know. I'm going to take it as maybe he went home. Because yeah. I know my God and Amen. I know he can heal. Amen. He can get us through any cer certain situation that we're going through. Why? Because he's done it with me and my family. When it's something's just coming and it's just like, yeah, I don't know how I'm going to pay that or I don't know how I'm going to do this. God provides. Mm -hmm. But you got to have that faith. Mm -hmm. It cannot be an empty prayer when you pray. You've got to have full faith. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, I love you all. Um, and I'm just so moved. You know, a lot of us, I know us young adults were on fire. So buckle up because it's going to be good. But it just, it leads back to just... James chapter 1, 2 through 4 again. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Yes. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Amen. So let it grow. I love you guys all. I want to see this place prosper. Just open your hearts. Have that full faith when you pray. Have that faith in God. He's got your back. He's here for you. Why? I'm a standing living testimony to that. All right. I love you guys. Thank you, Justin. Wow. That's the most I've ever heard him. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. This next young man is uh, uh, just loves. Uh, he, would, he would do it every Sunday. If I'm <laughs> uh, but I'm not. So, But this is his day. Jared, come on. <laughs> Let me just say, uh, all these guys are, are studying for the ministry. We have a, we've set up a, a place where they can study, and, and they're there every week doing that. And uh, this is part of their preparation. I'm taking notes, by the way, on everybody. And, and it's just, uh, it's a pleasure to have. 
you know, you look at, uh, you just look around, and then when you see people that just, uh, young people that are hungry for God, it's not just in these, but it's, it's all over. It's all over. There, there's young people every, everywhere I go. There's people that's really on fire. So there's there's something happening, folks. There's something happening, and the enemy will keep us blinded to it if we're not careful. And we need to look closely and see what's going on. Jesus is alive and well in our hearts in this world. Praise the Lord, Jerry. Oh, you got that. <laughs> Chen, Chen. Yes. I've never used one of these before. So cool. Good morning, church. Good morning, Good morning family. Um, I will echo the point made about the assembly 100%. I very, very much took so much away. I'm the kind of person who likes to compare certain things in my life to other things that have happened in my life, other things that I can draw comparisons to. And my dad, he came and he asked me after I got back on Saturday night, how was the assembly? And I took a second. I, I was like, I can't really compare it to anything. There, there was nothing that I could compare it to the, the gathering of believers from all areas of the world. Mm-hmm. Did you guys see the, the International Expo? Did you, did you guys see that, that exhibit? So cool, so yeah. cool. From yeah. so many different countries. So cool. Um, so, pop quiz real quick. Does anybody know the most quoted verse in the Bible? John 3.16. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but instead have eternal life. I'm going to take the verse before, the two verses beforehand, John chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, because I think this provides a lot of insight. It says, And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. Now, what is Jesus referring to with this statement, and why is it so significant? So if we look back in the Old Testament, we encounter a story of God's provision over the people. If you'd remember, after Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, Egyptian captivity, the Israelites found themselves in the desert. Now, what, what does the desert symbolize? I'd say just as the Israelites were prisoners in Egypt, I would venture to say that all of us, at some point in our lives, have been prisoners in some way or another. Prisoners in our sin, in our misconceptions and misled ideologies. And I bring this example pretty often, but me and my own personal walk, I was certainly a slave to my own misconceptions and sin. I was a person who had no interest in whether or not there's a God. I had no interest in God and getting closer to Him. and Instead, my relentlessness was used to pursue the things of this world, like money, fame, power. Um, and this would lead to my eventual drug use and consequently drug abuse. When we look at this specific story, we find that the Israelites are a group of people who had escaped bondage from Egypt but where there but where had that led them it had led them into the desert so the reward for their faithfulness and their god led escape out of egypt happened to be the desert i say this as a former non believer but i believe the church has kind of fallen short in certain areas including welcoming those who may be experiencing a desert of their own Oftentimes we find that as a result of us challenging these preconceived notions and misled ideologies and worldviews we built up for so long, we end up in the desert. I think we sometimes we expect people to they encounter Jesus, they come to terms with their with the fact that their sin and preconceived notions lead them to destruction, and then they we expect them to immediately repent. We expect them to immediately turn to Jesus-loving Christians who are unequivocally focused on God's will and God's will only. This story of Moses and the Israelites serves the purpose of reminding us of the desert that can sometimes follow after breaking free of bondage. Yes, yes, good. So we look back at the story of Moses in the desert. After Moses led the Israelites out of Egyptian captivity, he led them towards the Red Sea. 
And this trick definitely was not all sunshine and rainbows. Then Numbers 21 details how the people grew impatient with Moses and with God. They would say things like, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread. There is no water. And we hate this miserable food. This was the stuff that they were saying. Now, real quick, any parents in here, I don't know if you guys have ever been in this scenario. I would venture to say you have. Have you ever been on a long car ride, like a road trip or something, and you have kids in the back seat? And they're doing their old back seat complaining. They say, I'm hungry. Are we there yet? Can we go home? And you just want to, I don't know, like throw some poisonous snakes in that back seat, get them to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's what God did in this scenario. The Israelites were complaining. They were complaining about the trip. They were longing to be back in captivity, back in Egypt, what was bringing them bondage. So what did God do? He sent the poisonous snakes to bite them. <laughs> very odd. Very, very, very odd. Um, and the example of the back seat is probably as close as I can get to understanding God's real reasoning behind this. Although I do know that it was a form of judgment. He sent the poisonous snakes to deal with the rowdy children in the backseat, more or less. What follows this is one of those stories in the Bible where you have to think, okay, this is either true or this is insane. Because it's not predictable. It's not boring at all. We can even start from the fact that it might be insane, but naturally the Israelites, they start to notice the danger they're in. They see the poisonous snakes all around, and... Remember, there's no food, no water, they're in the middle of the desert, and now the poisonous snakes are attacking them. It's not a great situation. I'm having a really bad day. They go to Moses, the Israelites do, and they repent. They own up to their sin of speaking against God and Moses, and they ask Moses to pray to God for them so that the snakes may be taken from them. Now, you would assume that God, in his loving mercy, would just take away the snakes from the occasion. He could do that, you know? He can take away the snakes, the burdens in your life with just a single single move. But instead, if you remember how I said the story might be a little insane, this is where it gets insane. God tells Moses in Numbers chapter 21, verse 8, he says, make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. Now, there's so many different angles we could take that. First, why doesn't God just take away the snakes? We're at a place in the story where the Israelites, they fully grasp their wrongdoing and their error in lamenting God and Moses. They genuinely go to seek forgiveness and reconciliation with God. The snakes are here. People are dying. God, please take away these snakes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But you'll notice, though, both in reading this text and examining your personal lives, sometimes... God is a lot more concerned with your healing than protecting your peace. He's more interested in healing us than taking away what threatens our peace. So sending the snakes, as odd as it may seem to our 21st century minds, was an act of judgment by God. And I believe that judgment in this scenario is vitally important to understanding who God is. Because these are the Israelites. These are God's chosen people. Yes. The ones he made a co covenant with Moses over. Exodus 20, um, verse 2 says, I am the Lord your God. I am the God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I, the Lord, am your God. Couldn't he have reserved his, his judgment in this scenario? Or at least chosen a lighter punishment for the Israelites? Well, judgment in this context synonymous with justice. God is the ultimate lawgiver. Therefore, God gives the laws and operates in full justice when it comes to carrying them out. And because God is so just, and because we know at the end that evil must not win, and whatever is good and whatever is true must win, then sin cannot go unpunished, even if you're God's chosen people. To simply remove the snakes from the equation would be to simply remove the judgment. Rather, the judgment is lifted up so that the sinner might agree with God and repent and be healed. 
So we look back to Numbers 21, verse 8. God's instruction, all who are bitten will be healed. All who are bitten will live if they simply look at the snake. Now, I'll take you to a, take you back up a little bit. I'll take you to a, to a little psychology lesson. A doctrine of modern psychology and all fields of psychotherapy says look at what you're afraid of. Look at what you're terrified of voluntarily, mm -hmm. and you will become braver because of it. Mm -hmm. This is true with every fear, every phobia. If you voluntarily expose yourself, you will build up a sort of protection because oftentimes it's the avoidance of this fear, this phobia, this sin, it's the avoidance of it that causes it to grow and worsen. Because so God doesn't take away the snakes. Instead, he makes everybody braver because that's what's better. That's more reliable than safety. Bravery is more reliable than safety because in life, no matter if you're a mother, a father, a grandmother, grandfather, son, brother, sister, there's going to be moments where life calls you to be brave, to take a chance to walk on water. Life will call you to step out of safety, walk on water, and display bravery while doing so. So now we take another step back and observe this situation in a sort of practical view. The Israelites are facing judgment due to their sins, and as a result, they are being pushed out of safety. Remember, Paul tells us the wages of sin is death. So their sin brought death and destruction. Remember, these are poisonous snakes. The snakes are killing them. God asked, Moses asked God to intervene, and instead of, the Israel, instead of bringing the Israelites back to their place of safety, God gives them a way to find bravery, walk on water, and be healed. This is a very, very short story in the Bible, so not much is given in terms of context, but I'll tell you the Hebrew scholars' main interpretation and understanding of this map, of this message. The act of following God's leadership, Moses' leadership, to simply lift your eyes and look at it, and you will be healed. Mm -hmm. It's the simplest task, but at the same time, it's the message of the Bible as a whole. Will you follow the instruction that God has placed on your life? Will you do what the Lord has commanded you to do? The Lord commanded the Israelites to look at the bronze serpent and they will be healed. Will you do what the Lord is asking you to do? That's right. That's right. Because if you're like the Israelites, you look at it, you're healed. So God is calling his people to simply follow his commands and lift their eyes to the bronze serpent on the staff, which is lifted up. That which was killing the Israelites was lifted up before them. This has to be symbolic, right? What's the purpose? What's the purpose? Why is God telling us to take a look at what is killing us? So the idea was that the Israelites were to look on the bronze serpent and the staff. And in it, they were to see that God is just, punishment is just, and we deserve this punishment because we sinned against Adonai, our creator. We deserve the snakes attacking because of our sin against our Creator. They deserved punishment because they disobeyed and sinned against God. But because they looked up and followed His instructions, they now live. Well, thank the Lord. Taking all that into consideration, what do you think that we're supposed to see when we look to the cross of Christ? Look to the cross of Christ. I see. That's me. That should be me. That should be me up on the cross, crucified. It shouldn't be Jesus. Jesus is sinless. He's perfect. That should be me up there. That should not be Jesus up there. My sins are real, and they're true, and they're worthy of that kind of gruesome death, crucified to the cross. But because I looked upon him, I look upon the cross, and I see the justice of God. To see that though it should be me up on that cross, crucified for my sins and wrongdoings, 
Because God is just, and because if he lets sin slip under the rug, then he's not operating in justice and love, so sin cannot go unpunished. So because I look upon the cross, I accept the punishment for my sins, and I stand in agreement with God regarding the fact that when I sin against my creator, I'm setting up my own crucifix. Because I look up to the cross, I am healed. I am healed because I can see my God, yes. Jesus Christ. Getting up there is the substitute for me. <laughs> to bear the pain and the weight of my sins so that I can be healed and free. Jesus is taking my place. It should be me, but it's not me. It's Jesus. Amen. So I'll return to the memory verse, John chapter 3, verse 14. Go back to the main point of this. Just as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. The story excerpt of the bronze serpent in Numbers is often referred to as it's the shortest prophecy in the Torah regarding the Messiah. It's the shortest prophecy. It's only two verses. And it's the epitome of Christ the Messiah being lifted up. And our sins being forgiven because we look to him. Yes. Amen. And as a result, we look and we live. Amen. Yes. Now, Thank bravery you. still comes into the picture because what does the book of Acts tell us above all things? God doesn't want us to be churchy Christians. He doesn't want us to be religious. God wants us to be brave Christians. Amen. Able to step out, take the chance, be bold in our faith. Walk on water. And we're called to look at the cross in all its brutality, in all its gruesomeness, in all the bloodshed. We're called to look at the cross, and when we think we haven't looked hard enough, we need to look a little harder. What do you see? What do you see when you look at the cross? Because when we look at the cross, we're confronted with reality. I've often heard that the cross is sort of a mirror. You look at it, and then you see yourself in the cross, in the story of the, in the passion story. When we look at the cross, we're confronted with reality. So look at the cross, because it's less of a literal mirror and more of like a look at what you've become. When I look at the cross, I must be stuck with, look what I've become. Because we have become so trapped in our sin and our madness, induced by the fall, that when actual truth enters our midst, we crucify it. Yes. Yes. So where does bravery come in? It comes in looking to the cross. Because when Jared looks to the cross, Jared will grasp the true reality of where his sin has brought him. And it should be me paying the penalty, not Jesus. And once we lose sight of that, we must always keep that. It should be me paying the price, not Jesus. But instead, Jesus comes in to pay our price. Mm -hmm. Carl Jung thought that the passion story was archetypal, meaning it's a sort of limit story because you cannot write a more tragic story than the gospel. It's impossible to write a more tragic story because the cross of Christ, it's a culmination, it's an aggregation of all the sin and judgment all thrown in our face at once. It's sin and judgment and fear confronting us. So when we look to the cross, there, it, it can't get more tragic than that. Crucifixion is the most painful of deaths. I promise you guys, keep, stay with me. This is tough. Crucifixion is so painful. It's a slow and agonizing death. And it's a death of suffocation and dehydration. And when certain things of the cross co cause me to kind of shy away, that's when I need to look harder at it. Yes. I need to understand it for what it is. This was pain. If you want to talk about pain, this is pain. And Jesus went through pain for us. When we talk about Jesus, it's just so tragic because if you're Jesus in this situation, you know all this is coming. Plus, your best friend betrayed you into this. Plus, your people turned against you. 
Plus, they're led by a tyrant who doubts truth. Plus, if you're Jesus, you're completely innocent. Plus, everybody knows that you're completely innocent. Plus, the people choose a criminal to be released from this experience, even though they know he's a criminal, and they know that you're innocent. Plus, Jesus was young. Plus, Jesus did no wrong to anybody. All he's done was go around and help those who could not help themselves. So when we talk about this being a limit story, when we talk about this being the most tragic story that could have ever been conceived, this is why. Because it's a culmination of all the sin and judgment and fear all staring you in the face. When I think about all that the God of the universe has endured for me because of my sin and disobedience, I am confronted with the cross. We're called to look at it. So even though it's difficult, sometimes we look at it. We look at all the things we hate, all the sins we're terrified of, and suddenly we find that it's not just the serpent coming to bite me. It's like a thousand serpents. It's like everywhere I look within the story of the cross, there's another serpent. Everywhere. That's what we're looking at. To look harder. What do you see in the death? Look at it. What do you see? You look hard enough. You stare into the abyss hard enough and long enough. You see the death. But then you see the resurrection. You look hard enough into the crucifixion for our sins and you see life. You see death into life due to the supremacy of our God. Our Lord and Savior to where even death cannot defeat him. Mark 9 says, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of his enemies. He will be killed, but three days later he will rise from the dead. So many people in this world, it's going to get a little controversial, so many people in this world, they worship false gods. There are people in this world whose idea of God is based off of teachings that they derived from prophets who chose to spread their gospel by the sword. They lived sinful and hypocritical lives, and when they died, they stayed dead. I don't know about you guys, but when I go to examine truth, I'm a, I would like to consider myself a truth seeker as much as possible. I hunger and thirst for righteousness and truth. When I go to examine truth, especially when it comes to as big of a scale as this, I look at a few things. I have a few barometers. I look at the content of your teaching, what are you teaching? What are you dispersing? I look at how do you act? How do you behave? How do you carry yourself? And what happens after you die? And how lucky and grateful are we that we can serve a God who came to earth, did not touch a sword. He taught amazing ethical teachings. He lived a sinless life. And when he died, three days later, he came back to life. And this is the God we serve. Such a blessing. Amen. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much for allowing me to share this week. Thank the Lord. Amen. Was that absolutely great? Amen. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Justin. And now... Um, Josh, Mr. Personality, is going to give us our invitation uh, for prayer here. All right, church, I know it's a little early, so leading up this whole week, um, I, I know when, when we were talking about this and putting this whole program together, um, Jared had came to me and asked me, he said, um, would you be willing to do the altar call? And it's something that, you know, ever since I came here to Southside, I've always been a part of the altar calls, never given in it. So it's, it's, there's always a first time for everything, right? And so as, as Jerry was asking me this earlier in the week, or, you know, going back a couple weeks ago, but, you know, we're talking about this week, it was more so in the, in the aspect of, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do. It's the first time. What about, remember when the first time you've done something, you have no idea what you're doing, right? But you're going to go into, and I'm going to walk on water, and I'm going to trust that the Lord is going to handle this moment just as he's done in my life and many other moments leading up to this moment. So I know that if he's met me before, he's going to meet us here. He's going to meet yeah. me right here. Because his track record is perfect. You can see the same thing 
about your life and how the Lord has come into your life and he's met you in moments in your life when you needed him the most. Yes. Yes. <laughs> There's so much to be thankful for. There's so much to be thankful for. First and foremost, we have life this morning. Yes. We have breath in our lungs. We have clothes on our back. The lights are on. We can go out there. There's a restroom to use. There's water. There's water to drink. There's clean water. There's food. We are blessed. Yes. And how often do we take it for granted? Because I know I am. And so I just feel like the Lord has been, he's been challenging me with how fast I'm going to be 25 here in a few weeks. And I can tell you that as a 24-year-old, I can see just how fast this life goes by. Here today, gone tomorrow. So I felt the Lord was, was uh, put on my heart this past week was, don't count the days, but make the days count. And so we have to make the days count with the days that we're given because tomorrow's not guaranteed. The next hour is not guaranteed. All we have right now is this moment. That's all that we have is this moment that we get to share together that the Lord has given us breath in our lungs. He's given us life. And what are we going to do with it? What are we going to do with it? The ball is in our court. He woke us up the morning, so that means that the ball is in our court. What are we going to do with the time that he's given us that so quickly passes us by? Church, we are so close. We see how society is. This world is in ruin. It's falling right before our eyes. And it's the truth. And it, it hurts my and it hurts my heart because we 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 pursue after righteousness and holiness of God. And we see the destruction of society right before our very eyes. And so we seek this, but we're living in the midst of this. And it's a clash, and it's tough. It is tough. And that's why it's only done by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way through Jesus Christ. That's the only way we're going to make it through this life. It is hard. But with Jesus, all things are possible. I can say that because he's standing here. He saved my life. When I should have been dead, I should have been taken up off this earth. But he has me here for a reason. He has us here for a reason. We're his hands and his feet. Who is willing to say, Lord, here I am. I am a willing and able vessel before your feet hit the ground when you wake up in the morning. Jesus, thank you. When it's just you. Well, I'm not married or anything, so it's just me in my bedroom. But I say, thank you, Lord. It's just him and I. We start off the day. And you get that day wrong because the moments are short. And the world is growing darker as the enemy has, has his time. Just as scripture says, he's going to run rampant in the final days. But also God is going to pour out his spirit and his glory upon the entire earth. So who wants to be a part of it, church? Amen. Who wants to walk on water and say, Jesus, here I am. I'm going to do whatever you call me to do. I'm going to say whatever you want me to say. Holy Spirit, strengthen me. Lead me to wherever you need me to go. Speak to whoever you need me to speak to, Lord. Whatever it is, whoever you need me to bless, Lord. That's what we're here for, church. We're here to bless those around us and to love the way that Jesus loves. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Church, I just invite us up here this morning. What has he done in your life? I want to read a scripture real quick. It spoke to me. I wasn't quite sure what I was going to say. So I said, Holy Spirit, give me the word to say. And so here we are. I had nothing prepared. I said, Jesus, I'm a willing heart. And I just ask you, give me the word to say. And that you do it all, with all, only what you can do. And that you just may use me to be a blessing to someone today. Are we living our lives like that? Lord, who can I bless today? Who can I be a blessing to? Whose life can you use me to touch? Because he's brought a lot of people to me in my forming years. I'm still in my forming years, but I'm talking in the real forming years, in the earliness of, of from when I rededicated my life in this spot back in 2018 with Pastor Regis. And that moment forward when the Lord has been pouring and pouring and pouring in, sending so many, so many of his people just pouring through, just pouring out. Who's he calling you to, to pour out? he fills up our glass to pour it out 
right? Not us to keep it, but to pour it out. Pour out so that he can fill it up again and then we can keep pouring it out and pour it out and pour yes. it out. Yes. Who wants to be his vessel? Amen. Who wants to be a willing and able vessel to bless his people? So church, I'm going to ask if you can, please step up, please rise, and we're going to come and gather around this altar and we're going to give God the glory.